Hello, our topic is reading interventions. This is Kim. Jessica will present second and Cinnamon will present third. The focus of our presentation is the collaborative role of speech language pathologists in targeting reading disabilities, specifically dyslexia, by administering assessments and providing components of reading intervention for kindergarten to third grade students. In 2009, two-thirds of fourth graders in the U.S. were found to be reading at a level below proficient. In addition, multiple studies have demonstrated that with typical instruction, children who do not learn to read adequately in the primary grades will likely continue to struggle with reading in subsequent years. And estimates of dyslexia vary, ranging from 5 to 17.5 percent of students. And the reason for the variance in these numbers is that Dyslexia has a very diverse presentation, and that makes it difficult to define. In addition, some studies have differing criteria for determining the presence of dyslexia. However, no matter how you determine it, children with dyslexia need the support of a strong collaborative team that includes teachers, SLPs, administrators, and parents. In general, children with reading disabilities are a diverse group of poor readers whose reading impairments are caused by insufficient language skills. And there are two classes of reading disabilities, specific comprehension deficits and dyslexia, which is the focus of our assessment and intervention. Variety among students with reading disabilities. Some have poor decoding skills, some have poor comprehension, and some have deficits in both areas. One study looked at how first grade abilities predicted fifth grade abilities in terms of reading. A student's abilities in the areas of phonological processing, verbal language comprehension, and nonverbal reasoning in first grade were found to be significant predictors of their fifth grade reading comprehension abilities. So on to dyslexia which is a specific reading disability that follows an individual across the lifespan as I said before, it is difficult to define due to the diversity of the presentation. However, there are common factors. A student will have persistent and considerable difficulty learning how to read despite possessing a typical IQ and an absence of psychological neurological disorders. If a student is severely impacted, they will need additional support, accommodations, or special education to succeed. Speech and language deficits involved with dyslexia include a cluster of symptoms impacting word recognition and spelling abilities as well as other reading related difficulties. These symptoms typically reflect a weakness in the phonological components of language, so phonological awareness, memory, retrieval, production, and they may also have a secondary impact on reading comprehension. Dyslexia is a neurodevelopmental disorder of unknown cause although there are several hypotheses. What we do know is that there is a neural component, so individuals with dyslexia have abnormalities in brain structure that can be detected. In addition, there is a genetic component, so it runs in families. What does not cause dyslexia? Well, vision problems do not cause dyslexia, although they may co-occur, and you need to rule out vision problems. Um, a lack of intelligence, motivation, ineffective classroom instruction do not cause dyslexia. Now the International Dyslexia Association has this great list of potential signs of dyslexia in the classroom. And this list is in the addendum of your handout as well as the website for IDA and I highly recommend you check it out. It's a great list and the websites are fantastic. Um, there's actually a US IDA website and an Ontario branch IDA website and there may be more. Um, so potential signs of dyslexia in the classroom. Reading difficulties, writing difficulties, oral language difficulties, and mathematics difficulties. And I'm just going to pick out a couple. For instance, a child may not want to read aloud. They may avoid that. Or they may use context clues to identify words instead of trying to sound it out or learn the word by sight. Um, they may have spelling problems, they may have an inability to understand how or why words rhyme, and um, mathematics are also impacted, so they may have trouble remembering math facts or sequencing multi-step problems. So to understand the subtypes of dyslexia, you have to look at ch how children acquire reading skills. 
So students with dyslexia have a variety of reading-related strengths and weaknesses, which impact the planning of both assessment and intervention. So the subtype of dyslexia is determined by the type of impairment. Children acquiring reading skills are presented with two types of words. You have the regular words that follow the grapheme-phoneme conversion rules, so the letter is associated with the phoneme that you would expect, and the irregular words that do not follow those rules, and you know those words, we know and love them in English. So for the regular words, you use a sublexical strategy when you're learning how to read, and you use those grapheme-phoneme conversion skills to decode those words. Now with the irregular words, you use a lexical strategy. So you add those written words to your memory by sight. And where you're adding those words to your written memory is called the orthographic lexicon. MacArthur discussed dyslexia as being subtypes along a continuum, with phonological dyslexia on this side, called primary sublexical impairment. Um, it means they have impaired sublexical reading skills and relatively typical lexical skills. So they have difficulty reading non-words due to an impairment of the GPC skills that we discussed in the last slide. Surface dyslexia is on the other side of the continuum. It's also called primary lexical impairment. And so they'll have impaired lexical reading skills and typical sublexical skills. So they're going to have difficulty reading those irregular words because they have an impaired orthographic lexicon. And that impairment in turn impacts the link between that lexicon and the phonological lexicon and their semantic knowledge. However, what typically happens is mixed dyslexia or mixed reading impairment. And this is the majority of children with dyslexia. They have impaired sublexical and lexical skills to varying degrees. One may be more impaired than the other, but it is not the imbalance of the two outside parts of the continuum. So they have difficulty reading both non-words and irregular words, and they have an impairment of GPC skills and the orthographic lexicon, and this combination creates an impairment of their phonological output as well. If children who are dyslexic get effective phonological training in kindergarten and first grade, they will have significantly fewer problems in learning to read at grade level than do children who are not identified or helped until third grade. 74% of children who are poor readers in third grade remain poor readers in the ninth grade. Often they can't read well as adults either. This tells us that early intervention is key. We know that dyslexia persists throughout an individual's life with highly variable outcomes. Unfortunately, only roughly one-fifth of individuals with dyslexia acquire sufficient reading skills by the time they reach adulthood. Their prognosis is influenced by the presentation and severity of dyslexia, the existence of comorbid factors, and it is also influenced by the instruction and intervention resources available to them. One study found that there is promise in the future of neuroprognosis. In this study, they found brain activation scans were shown to predict long-term improvement in reading abilities in children with dyslexia. In some instances, they were more accurate than standardized measures of speech and language. SLPs have a strong understanding of phonological processing, which is a key component in the assessment and treatment of dyslexia. As such, with the roles of a speech-language pathologist in the development of reading and writing skills should include prevention, identification, assessment, intervention, and other roles. Hi, I'm Jess. I'm going to be doing the assessment portion of the presentation. So a quick caveat about um, reading assessment. Um, because students can sometimes learn reading skills so quickly relative to how complex they are, if we've been trying with this intervention for a long time and you're not seeing improvement, not seeing improvement, not seeing it, and then all of a sudden um, the light bulb comes on and, and you see it really fast, that's wonderful for us as educators, but um, it's not so great for assessments because it can kind of skew them. So um, that's just important to remember. Um, obviously, reading assessments are very useful for that slow, painful, growing change over time that we so often see as educators. But it's just good to remember that they might not show the whole picture. So now we've got just some examples of different reading skills and how they're assessed. You're probably familiar with a lot of these, a lot of these skill, a lot of these tests. Um, and as as you know, despite the the neat little categories that I that I put them into, um, reading isn't necessarily 
that neat. The skills bleed into each other. So if I'm having a hard time with phonics, I might not score so well on one of the comprehension tests, despite um, what a good critical thinker I am. Next, you've got the pre-literacy assessments, um, which they're usually given between three years old and first grade. Most of them are screening assessments. Um, and one thing I really like about the Dibbles is that it has that same pre-literacy um, assessment, but they, they make it for older kids as well. Um, and we'll talk about that more later. And then below that, you can see some tests which um, don't have the word reading in any of the titles. Um, you may not be as familiar with these, but um, they're given to rule out other etiologies when a student has reading problems. So like uh, these top two might be given by occupational therapists. Um, it's not really going to matter how well I know phonics. Um, that's not really going to show up in any of these reading tests if I can't do that. Um, the same thing with memory. If, if I can't remember which goes with which, it doesn't matter what a good grasp of the phonological system of English I have. Um, so these are important just to um, remember that a reading problem doesn't necessarily mean dyslexia or even a reading disability. It could be an indication of something bigger. So we really need to partner with occupational therapists and um, our school psychologists to make sure that we know about that. Um, and next we have um, a dyslexia specific assessment, um, which we're going to talk about later. Um, and then a whole slew of multidimensional assessments, which you're probably familiar with. So the first one that I want to kind of go into depth on is the dyslexia screening instrument. Um, obviously, I was pretty attracted to this one because um, it was one of the few I could find and find research on that um, had the word dyslexia in the name. Um, and it's for school age children and uh, lasts about 15 minutes given during the referral process. Um, and basically what it is is a teacher survey. So teachers rate these 33 statements on a scale of one to five. Um, and then at the end, you've either passed or you've failed, and if you failed, you're at risk. Um, which is a very, I feel, a very appropriate way to put it. It doesn't diagnose you, it just tells how at risk you are. Um, because obviously, while this would be very helpful to, to give to a teacher or even to a paraprofessional um, of a child that we were um, in the process of referring, um, we probably wouldn't want to use this just to diagnose a child with dyslexia. So I just thought that was a really good example of the role of assessment, that assessments should just be one, one part of what we as professionals do to evaluate students. Um, another assessment that is useful with dyslexia is the um, PALS, and it's used for ages from pre-K to third grade. Uh, it takes about 20 minutes. It's basically an assessment um, of phonological awareness. Um, and you've got an example of it right here. Um, this is from the kindergarten one. Uh, it's the rhyme awareness example. Um, and it's given in a group, so very easy to incorporate into morning center time in kindergarten. Um, and they each have their own piece of paper. Uh, they shouldn't be able to see their neighbors. And um, you say... You tell them to put their finger on the picture of the mop, touch each picture as I name it, mop, top, ring, can, and then they, they of course circle the one that rhymes. Um, and then the last one is the dibbles, and that's the one we're going to go the most into depth on. Um, the dibbles, like I said before, is ages K through 6. Um, the duration varies because there's several different skills that it assesses and you don't have to assess them all at once, which is nice. Um, they recommend it three times per school year. Um, and it serves two functions, to identify children who are not acquiring those early literacy skills. And what the Dibbles is all about is acquiring. It's not like reading line by line. It's what skills are you acquiring right now. Um, and it's also to monitor progress. So it's not only to... To evaluate students, it's to evaluate this curriculum that you're doing. So um, we want to know if this skill has improved. If I'm given the test in January, I want to know if it's improved since the fall. Um, one thing that I like about it is even though they're super short assessments, they have really good um, 
instructions really detailed. Um, just some examples of that. And then just a few examples of the different things that are um, that are assessed. So you've got your phoneme segmentation, um, which can be kind of tricky, which as we all know is uh, is pretty is an important um, indicator of decoding. And then oral reading fluency, which I thought was interesting because um, it tells what to do if you come across a student with an articulation or a dialectical difference. Um, so again, really specific, really short. And I'm here's an example. Word. Here are some make-believe words. We can read these make-believe words by saying the sounds of the letters or read the whole word. Watch me read this word. Song. I can say the whole word or I can say each sound. Song. Your turn. You read this one. Speech language pathologists have a variety of options when planning interventions for dyslexia. One reason is because of the variability of symptoms and severity associated with the condition. Another reason is related to the treatment environment. Response to intervention, or RTI, is a promising alternative. This video provides a brief explanation of how RTI works. Here, we'll look at a three-tiered model, often depicted as a triangle, as one example of how a tiered framework can be used as a school-wide strategy for instructing all students. All students will participate in Tier 1 instruction. At this level, they'll receive effective differentiated instruction provided by the general classroom teacher as part of an evidence-based core curriculum. The evidence-based instruction offered at this level can be expected to meet the learning needs of 80 to 85 percent of all students. For students who don't respond adequately to Tier 1 instruction, more intensive interventions come into play. Tier 2 interventions build upon the differentiated instruction provided at Tier 1 by offering students more systematic instruction and interventions strategically designed to help them catch up in areas of difficulty. These interventions are usually delivered to a small group of students within the general classroom, either by the classroom teacher or by another team member supporting the teacher who has also been trained to deliver the interventions. Tier 2 interventions will be offered to the 15% of students for whom Tier 1 instruction was not sufficiently intensive to meet their specific learning needs. But here is a critical point. Students who receive targeted Tier 2 interventions continue to participate in general Tier 1 instruction. Tier 2 interventions do not replace the core curriculum. They supplement it. For example, Dennis has been selected to receive Tier 2 interventions based on the results of recent reading fluency data. He'll continue to participate in the 90 minutes of core reading instruction that is provided to all students in Tier 1 each day. But in addition, he'll spend another 30 minutes per day receiving targeted reading instruction at Tier 2. Under RTI, his opportunities for learning and for catching up to his classmates will have been extended. We've saved the most intensive interventions available for the small percentage of students who still lag significantly behind their peers in making academic gains. Tier 3 interventions supplement the previous tiers by providing the most intensive evidence-based interventions delivered to individual students or in very small groups. Again, the intensity of instruction at this level increases. The size of student groups is reduced. Again, RTI is a tier strategy that helps provide quality, individualized instruction to all students within a school, including those who may have reading disabilities such as dyslexia. At Level 1, SLPs would be active in making decisions about the adoption of literacy curriculum packages. Good reading programs should include the Big Five, phonemic awareness instruction, phonics, text fluency, vocabulary instruction, and regular exercises in comprehension of written text and oral language. For Tier 1, SLPs work collaboratively with teachers to plan appropriate instruction that is based on sound, scientific research. A core reading program should utilize explicit instruction, be organized, and offer consistent routines. Reading Street, Ladders to Literacy, and many other programs offer the elements necessary for effective core reading instruction. Tier 1 instruction and intervention can help the SLP catch reading problems very early on. Pushing into the classroom as a co-teacher or as a consultant 
can provide valuable support to teachers while allowing the SLP to take a proactive role. Here is an example of a Tier 2 intervention. Sometimes this level requires pull-out, depending on how loud the classroom environment is during these lessons. This is a picture of a rake, rake, rake. If you were going to write that word rake, what letter would you write first? R. Okay. Say it again. Say it slowly. R. R A. A. What do you think would come A. next? A. Ball? A. Yeah. And how about the next time? Do you think so? Let's say it again. Say it with me. Rake. Uh, I'm going to the wolf says on this page, then I will blow your house down. What two letters do you think you see at the beginning of then? Th. Th. Just like the word you know. What word do you know starts like that? Natasha. Ho, ho. It's done. It is. So that word is then. This word says Run. This says run. But you know what? Dante, I can change that word to ran by changing the middle letter. Hmm. This is a word I think you've read before. This word says dead. Is it? Take away the I and put an A, it spells dead. As you can see, instruction is very explicit at these levels. Pause the video at this point and try this activity. Beginning at Tier 2, SLPs can hone in on data for students showing deficits. Those having difficulty with phonological awareness tasks and letter sound associations may be at risk for dyslexia or another related reading disorder. Studies support explicit, systematic instruction in both these areas for optimal results. As students show a lack of responsiveness to instruction, the level of intensity increases. There are several ways to increase the intensity of instruction. The SLP and other team members may decide to decrease group size, increase duration of the instruction, or provide more explicit instruction. If students show continued lack of response to interventions at Tier 3, a referral should be made. Then, formal evaluations are conducted to determine whether the student will qualify for special education. If a student qualifies based on a communication disorder or disability, the SLP participates in development of the IEP and subsequent implementation, implementation of language-related interventions. When the SLP determines that a student has deficits consistent with a dyslexic diagnosis, it is critical that the student receive systematic, well-structured, multi-sensory interventions. Assessment data is likely to warrant training in letter sounds, phoneme awareness, and the linking of letters and phonemes through writing and reading from text at the appropriate level. Data should be reviewed regularly to determine progress toward benchmark goals and direct instructional strategies targeting word recognition and spelling should be utilized. Speech language pathologists have many viable options for treating reading disorders like dysle dyslexia within public schools, but funds are often limited. Currently, many intervention methods fall short of providing dyslexic children with adequate support. For this reason, more research is needed to fully realize the positive and negative aspects of RTI as an effective early intervention. With the RTI model, SLPs have a rare opportunity to help ameliorate the effects of dyslexia for some students and possibly prevent some reading disabilities through extensive early intervention. Public schools often have limited financial resources, as I stated earlier, making creative solutions critical. RTI is a creative solution.
Thank you.